Hey everybody, Joe here from the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. If you enjoy what we do here on the show and you think it's worth your hard-earned money, you can support the show via Patreon. Just a $1 donation gets you access to bonus episodes, our Discord, and regular episodes before everybody else. If you donate at an elevated level, you get even more bonus content. A digital copy of my book, The Hooligans of Kandahar, and a sticker from our Teespring store. Our show will always be ad-free and is totally supporter-driven. We use that money to pay our bills, buy research materials that make this show possible, and support charities like the Kurdish Red Crescent, the Flint Water Fund, and the Halo Trust. Consider joining the Legion of the Old Crow today. And now back to the show. Let Bacchus' sons not be dismayed, but join with me, show me your blade, come drink and sing, and lend your aid to help me with the chorus, and instead of spa, we'll drink brown ale. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Lions Up by Donkeys podcast. I'm Joe, and still with me, trapped in the content mines, is Francis, host of Hell of a Way to Die. What's up, Francis? I'm very excited. Uh, But, you know, to get to the point that everybody... um, Everybody's favorite part of this story, which is, you know, Custer's last stand. We have to jump in a time machine and go back to the time that the Supreme Court is trying to return us to, which is the late 1800s. Now, when we left you last time, the allied tribes were uh, kind of uh, joining around Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse uh, and joining in their Sundance vision of uh, um, defeating the encroaching American soldiers. Uh, and they had gathered in the literal thousands at the bank of the Little Bighorn River, hence where the the uh, the battle gets its name in English and and uh, and Native Americans knows the uh, the greasy grass, which is gross, and I like it. Um, why? <laughs> why is the grass greasy? What is that? What is is there a perp- Is there is there something about the grass specifically? Is it greasy with the blood of white men? What's what's the greasy here? Uh, it was fried in full fat oil. I don't fucking know. <laughs> do, do you live uh in the Little Bighorn area? It's a, it's the Midwest, so it's it's not the Midwest. Where is a little bit? No, it's Montana, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And even then, like you know, this is about like the Black Hills of of uh, of the Dakotas, which I also don't consider the Midwest. No, that's not. I guess I was thinking more of like you know some sort of deep fried cheese curds of Wisconsin, but that's too far east. I don't know. I don't know what's greasy in, in South Dakota. And fried uh, uh, like goat balls or like a Colorado thing, I feel like. What is, uh, yeah, the Rocky Mountain Oysters. Um, yeah. The goat, Those are goat, the goat balls, the right? Bull, no, bull testicles. Oh. I well, think whatever. That, and that's, enjoy eating that, your balls, whoever you are. <laughs> yeah, enjoy, enjoy your greasy grass balls, I suppose. Yeah, uh, are, are you uh, from the area of the Little Bighorn? Is, is your grass, in fact, greasy? Could you tell us why? And uh, <laughs> right it's right a medical condition. Yeah, go clean your grass. Yeah, so slick its hair back. <laughs> this um, grass has got too much product in it. <laughs> it's got the the suavecito in it. Uh, now, uh, that's the o- only reason why I know about the name of that is because that's the pomade that Nick used, and it made his hair like into a helmet. Um, <laughs> he used greasy never, grass on his hair is that what it was called i never had enough hair or style to ever pull it off um i just buzzed it down man people people in the army who like grow their hair out and do weird things with it what are you doing i can oh, respect them my hair was always way i mean i've my hair is very armenian it's super super thick and super super curly so i can't do shit with it like if it grows beyond like just enough uh, to to show that it exists, it goes straight up um, into like completely uncontrollable curls. It's it's awful. You get a fro? No, not quite. Um, because like a fro, ha- you can rock a fro. If if I grew my hair out, it it it, it I look like an unkempt mountain person. Um, <laughs> because it's effectively what I am. <laughs> I was gonna say. I mean, currently you are a kempt mountain person, so that's right. Yeah. That's about to go real, real south, let me tell you. <laughs> now, uh, when we left you last time, uh, the American advance had been turned away at the Battle of the Rosebud. And now we get to talk about everybody's favorite failure, George Armstrong Custer, which we did talk about a little bit before because, you know, he was involved in the gold expedition that started this whole thing. But now we get to tell, talk about what happened after that uh, noted West Point basement dweller. Hey, you know, you know what they call the lowest graduating person from West Point? 
My former platoon leader, probably. You call him fucking sir, don't you? <laughs> you stand at attention. This is normally where I would say, like, the producer of this podcast, but uh, <laughs> Nate didn't go to West Point. Nah, uh, Nate went to a normal school. Yeah, that's probably why he likes us. <laughs> <laughs> we have West Pointers that like us. I don't know if they'd ever, like, you know, <laughs> I don't know if our relationship would go any further than... Uh, casual twitter acquaintances um i've had two west actually three west pointers on the show so i know you're out there we love you you personally not your classmates <laughs> not the rest of you <laughs> not, in not general you. Uh, right uh, uh, you know on an individual level i'm sure you're all people but as a whole i do not consider you people <laughs> <laughs> i mean don't don't get it twisted we're, we're we don't want to pass up the people who truly earned our scorn and that is vmi graduates <laughs> um we've talked about them before too uh all of the hate that i project at west pointers is actually all earned by vmi people everything that i i say about west pointers is only rooted in the fact that i'm a bitter enlisted person right like but vmi and like the cat like was it the naval academy truly just hives of scum and villainy <laughs> I think I think VMI is that the one that we just had a I can't remember which military prep school it was uh, where there was um, a whole lot of just a whole lot of abuse and hazing and and everything going on. But the thing is, that's all of them. So I'm going to say that certainly sounds like VMI uh, literally founded to uh, propagate slave owning military leaders. That's fun. I mean, the Air Force Academy is awful, but at least they have a sweet anime sword. Uh, <laughs> I mean, all steep in, in horrible religious bigotry. But, you know, whatever. Their chapel looks like pretty it, cool, but that's about it. You know, it, that, it's like uh, someone told me how weird, uh, weirdly religious the Air Force Academy is. So the chapel makes sense. I know you think people who are training to, like, spit in the face of God and fly jets at, like, Mach 6 or whatever <laughs> wouldn't be super religious. But what do I know? We talked a little bit about Custer before, but uh, now we have to talk about him a little bit more in depth. We talked about his West Point career. Um, But for starters, Custer was really, really known for liking him some Custer. He loved himself. Um, He was already something of a press darling of his own making because he always made sure to make friends with journalists and newspaper people and bring them along with him uh, when uh, he campaigned or where he was stationed so we could lavish them with love, attention, and and probably more than a few unethical gifts. Um, So whatever they wrote made him look very, very good. So hold on. So I'm trying to like... And, and, you know, the, the last couple weeks of discussion, we've we've talked about like these military like... I, trains, not like a physical locomotive, but like, you know, moving large masses of people from one place to another militarily. You know, you've got obviously it's like we, we we've all got to move over here. Cool. And like, you know, you and I as soldiers in the 21st century be like, yeah, you get into an LMTV, you get into an airplane or whatever. But they're like, no, we have to walk and we have to bring like 300 head of cattle along with us yeah, so that much. we can eat. And now you've also got like all these journalists like I cannot imagine that like the cavalry at this point um, in late 1800s, like there's nothing. What what do the natives need scouts for? I imagine these people like just sound and smell and just like a huge dust cloud from 10 miles away at any given point. I mean, you pretty much nailed it. I mean, that's one of the one of the problems with their military operations in general. Um, I mean, a lot of it won't matter, especially in the ca- in the case of Custer, because a, he had surprise. He thought he didn't, but he had surprise and didn't fucking matter. So, so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> now he he was a, he was one of those guys that tried to control every little bit of information that came out about him, um, and made sure that it portrayed him as some kind of hard bitten, hard charging, manly man, plains warrior. Um, he was General Mattis before General Mattis. No, this is the first. He's the first PAO man. Is the everybody? Everything's got to wrap through me before it's uh, author, uh, authorized for release. <laughs> kind of. Um, I mean, with the added difference of like, if the journalist is critical of him, he's they're just not going to get access to the army again, at least around him, because the army, even though it is centralized at this point, you know, distances are a thing. It's the late eighteen hundreds. If you're not stationed out in the west with these guys, you might as well not exist because it takes so long for word to travel. But this is where the war was at this point. 
So like you didn't want to burn any bridges. Um, it's it's the journalism equivalent of just publishing a, a police press release. Right. Were there journalists that were critical of him? Was there anybody critical of him? Uh, I mean, Not again, he's alive. Um, Not always alive. All right. I mean, he, he did a very good job uh, making himself look good with help, of course. I mean, he wrote a couple sure. books, too, um, that, like again, made him look like this mainly man Wild West type. Uh, but then he died and he was a martyr. So, like, you couldn't talk <laughs> bad about him. So, like, yeah, it, it's honestly pretty recent where people have been giving an, a, an honest appraisal of, of Custer, which it, it's unfortunately, you, you know, you have 100 fucking years plus of 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 hero worship to chop down even without the even without the hero worship though like i i feel like common you know just common sense like you know uh this uh, the the civil war was about the state's rights the state's rights to do what right like uh custer was a hero when he was fighting these natives why was he fighting the natives though like answer that did he fucking deserve it because he was fucking with somebody else on their property mm, that sounds like castle law well, I mean, it's it's easy to square when the people who champion, you know, the quote unquote Indian fighters of the West don't see Native Americans as people. Sure. But I mean, like, you know, later on, like now that, you know, obviously, as you said, people are more turning a more critical eye to it. It is just that I and I'm very glad that like in the last, you know, couple of decades, you know, multiple decades, but obviously not since the 1800s, that there is more of a reckoning of uh, no, no, you uh, the natives were were like were, were pe- they were people as it turns out joe as it turns out they were people uh, i mean who knows and- what people can learn in school and depending on what state they live in learning about this might be considered critical race theory or something it could be like i i i think about what i learned about native americans and in, in history and it's uh it is not anything that uh, i have learned since then so I had a, I had also, a pretty I decent know. public school education. I mean, all things considered, but I mean, for a lot of people, they're like, "Well, I didn't learn about this in school." I'm like, you know, barring some of the most egregious shit, you probably did, but you're also a child and you weren't paying attention. That's fine, exactly. Or you forgot it because it's been twenty years, you know. But also, history's long. Like, there's so much of it. It's learned. I can confirm. And- yeah, I can <laughs> confirm that. <laughs> Many people are saying. History is, in fact, long. There's a lot of it. And, you know, the more, the more you know, uh, atomized you get with it, just the more history there is. Because it's easy to just be like, yeah, the, the Native Americans versus the U.S. Cavalry. But, like, as you have been pointing out, the Native Americans, some of them were, some of the Natives were working with the U.S. government. Some of them weren't. Uh, some of them were, you know, there's just all kinds of intricacies. Everybody's got their own agenda. Everybody's got their own shit going on. Uh, and everybody's got their own idea of what victory looks like, and uh, they don't all mesh. So I am glad that uh, that it seems like more of this is is kind of coming out. Of course, it's not going to stop the weird chuds, but you know, uh, give it another thirty or forty years, they'll die off. And the only thing, the only histor- historical records that'll be left is your podcast. I mean, there's going to be someone with like a Twitter profile picture of like Custer with laser eyes out there or something. I mean, it's also important to remember that, like, I didn't learn about this in high school. Okay, maybe your high school did suck. That's a very good possibility. But also, public schools, general education, um, like, your history education is not going to be that in depth. It probably should be, but, you know, budget cuts or whatever. Uh, you're not rich. You don't get a good education. You got to put math in there. You got to learn, like, Spanish. Somebody's got to teach you art at some point. There's got to be, you got to read books. Like, there's a lot going on. And if history is not your favorite subject in high school, it certainly wasn't mine. It was the only subject I paid attention to. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm interested in history now. Um, and I do read, you know, historical books. I'm reading, but I like, I like to read history books that are very specific to what I want to learn about. Like I'm learning about the rise and the fall of the Anheuser-Busch family. I'm from St. Louis. The fucking original brewery is like four miles from my house. Um, so, like, that's something I will read a, a really big, long book about, you know, the the, An, the Anheuser-Busch family from, you know, the mid-1800s until now. Uh, but, like, if you're like, do you want to read this book about the Schlitz Brewery? Fuck no. Get out of here. I don't give a shit. It's a step too far. I mean, I also, I'm speaking from, I'm speaking from a very American-centric point of view with my, with my opinions on education. And I don't 
I do not mean to make that as like a defense of the American public school system. It is not good. However, like, you know, on a, the way it's designed, you, I would be very surprised if many people learned about the Battle of Little Bighorn um, in an educational setting before like an undergrad in, in American history. Um, unless, I mean, granted, there's also different kinds of schools out there now. I know Europeans have a different kind of school system depending on what country you're from. Um, also, I mean, some people don't get any American history because they're not fucking American. I don't know. Yeah. What do, what do the British learn about the American revolution? Uh, it's like a, a, a day and a half of like, and then those assholes. So we let them go. Fuck them. I mean, to be fair, it's probably about as good as ours when like our education completely cuts out the, uh, the help that we got from the French. Um, now, uh, there's a there's a large part of uh, of George. Speaking of a different part of uh, education that America likes to skip over, Reconstruction. Um, George uh, Custer was in the army during, or the, the volunteers, and then the army during and after the Civil War, where he was stationed in Texas for Reconstruction. Great fucking job there, boys. And uh, his own men hated him uh, like a lot. At one point, there was damn near like a strike of them like demanding he be reassigned. It didn't work. Um, and they called him, quote, a vain dandy. <laughs> West Point strikes again. <laughs> um, so it seems like if you spent, if you were anybody that was not, he considered a peer or a superior, um, that he, he kind of had to worry about what you thought about him. If you spent any kind of extended amount of time around him, you immediately saw through his bullshit and hated him. Nobody really has any positive things to say about him unless they kind of had to. Um, now, he was so used to being allowed to do pretty much whatever he wanted uh, from his time in the Civil War. I remember, he was the boy general. Everybody loved him. That uh, Less than 10 years before his fateful and final battle in 1868, he got arrested for going AWOL. Um, now, I should point out, he was a lieutenant colonel. Um, and this would not be the last time this happened. Uh, he requested leave, which was then denied during an upcoming campaign in the West. So he just went on leave anyway. Again, I really hate saying things that I support about this guy. I'd fucking do that, too. Oh, yeah. Deny my leave. I want to, you know, if if I'm looking for a long weekend in Atlantic City doing some hedonism and I've already bought my tickets and the, the general says no, I mean... Come on. He was a lieutenant colonel. Him. I think he just wanted to go see his wife or something. But also, he was he pretty routinely cheated on her on his wife, so it could have been one of his many mistresses. It was one of the things that like one of his subordinates fucking hated him because his subordinate was very much an uptight Puritan, and Custer was pretty open with fucking around on his wife. So he's like, you know, he thought of him as a man of low morals, which like arguably he is, and mostly for the genocide though. Right. Um, I'm going to say like, the things I'm going to I'm going to judge him for his adultery is very low on the list and the genocide is quite high. Uh, right. It's not great. <laughs> We're not going to say that it's great. And you know what? Maybe maybe he and his wife had an agreement. I don't know. I'm not going to make any assumptions. I will say, though, <laughs> the murdering mil- uh, hundreds of people is is probably a little bit worse. It's kind of like when everybody talks about like Eamon Goth, who was like a Nazi camp commandant who was so bad the Nazis fired him. <laughs> um, and like, they're like, oh, Did everybody stay alive in the death camp. Like, <laughs> no, no, he stole from the Nazis. That was his downfall. They're like, well, yeah, that's bad, I guess. Because like what he was stealing was like Jewish property. But like being a camp commandant of fucking Auschwitz is significantly worse. Or I think he was Auschwitz. I don't know. But yeah, like I, I'm on the. On the things I'm going to rate here, like embezzlement isn't very high, you know? Um, I mean, we still do that. I mean, to be fair, we still do the genociding too sometimes, but, you know, we keep it a little bit more quiet. Yeah, keep it to a dull roar, you know, just like in elementary school. Yeah, he got arrested for going AWOL. He'd do that a couple of times, um, but and mostly because he, he really didn't seem, even though he wasn't, he wasn't very high ranking. Like he wasn't. Uh, politically pure enough to get a White House gig. He wasn't an actual general. He was a brevet general. So it was like temporary. Um, but he still really didn't like listening to anybody that wasn't him um, or agreed with him. Um, but Fair. I get it. Now, immediately after getting released from being arrested for AWOL, he, let, he read a, uh, uh, he led a, a raid on uh, a Native American named Chief Black Kettle's camp. And he wrote a dispatch saying he killed over 100 warriors. Now, he didn't kill over 100 warriors. Black Kettle himself says he killed only 11 people, and they were all unarmed. Um, even his own soldiers don't, uh, his own soldiers' stories don't match Custer's story. 
Um, and it was a massacre, not a battle, uh, which this, this happens a lot in uh, Western history, especially in the history of the uh, Native American genocides in America, where things are originally labeled, labeled a battle. And then you quickly realize there was no battle. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the Wounded Knee Massacre was called the Battle of Wounded Knee for several years. Yeah, it's, it's only a battle if both sides have guns. Yeah. When um, one side has guns and the other side doesn't, that's just that's just a massacre. Yeah. There was also the in the immediate aftermath of this raid. He used uh, uh, native children and women as human shields so he could withdraw because the actual warriors were showing up. Um, so, yeah, he's the kind of guy who literally lies to make his war crimes worse. So I actually take it back. He's he's more like Mikuya. Um, the guy who claims he <laughs> killed Bin Laden. And like at this point, he's claimed to kill like several dozen people and threatens to kill more pretty, pretty regularly. Now, he's he's on the outs because he said that um, people having mental health problems shouldn't have guns. And every person with mental health problems on Twitter just had uh, massive issues with that. Uh, and he has uh, forsaken the Second Amendment. If you're wondering where our Bill of Rights is uh, standing right now. It's Mikuya, the guy who everybody thinks shot Bin Laden, is uh, a traitor now. We're we're truly going through it, aren't we? <laughs> you know, at least I gotta I gotta say, at least the silver lining is like watching other dumb chuds fall too. Because like the thing about like a fascist government um, that I have noticed, not necessarily just with ours, but like you know ones in the past, is that like it really eats itself. So all these terrible people. They're going to have their day in the sun, but also more than likely they're going to get ground out and I don't know, end up selling fucking pillows by the side of the side of the road or something with uh, the my pillow guy. I don't know. Like, I don't know where Jesse Kelly ends up, um, but hopefully it's um, you know, somewhere court, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Family court. I don't fucking know. Somebody's got to take something away from him. And one of the downsides of, well, upsides, downsides, I don't know, of reactionary politics is you have to constantly be reacting, right? And that, that, fire, that fires in every direction, baby. <laughs> uh, now, if, uh, if, if this wasn't weird enough for, uh, uh, for Custer, you know, going AWOL's lieutenant colonel getting arrested then doing massive amounts of war crimes, uh, he got into politics. Uh, now, we, we talked about this before. We love, we love a veteran uh, getting into politics, don't we? Well, he first got out of the military with intention of running, po- uh, like running for office, and realized that, like, ooh, don't really have enough money for that. Um, so he he kind of became a whistleblower, but the term whistleblower doesn't really fit because it it gives him a certain amount of good faith, <laughs> you know. So he got involved in something called the Trader Post scandal, where the Secretary of War, William Belknap, uh, under Ulysses S. Grant, was definitely getting kickbacks for selling trade deals to private companies uh, to supply local military bases that were out in the frontier, which Custer was at one of them. It was fucking Kellogg, Brown, and Root of the 1800s. Yeah. Um, now this was without a doubt happening. Belknap resigned. Uh, because Grant encouraged him to resign. Grant, and at that point, most people had a quite a loose grasp on what an impeachment was and how you could do it. Uh, and he believed that, like, look, if you resign, they won't impeach a private citizen, and that will protect both of us. He was immediately impeached. <laughs> <laughs> he pissed enough people off, like, yeah, we don't fucking care. We're impeaching him anyway. Uh, no, bro, it's cool. If you if you just come over... If the teacher's 10 minutes late, we all get to leave. It's cool. Exactly. That's the law. Yeah. Um, now, uh, that seemed to surprise Grant because he was kind of a big fucking dumbass. Uh, um, now, one of the forts that was brought up in this whole scandal was Fort Abraham Lincoln, which is where Custer was stationed. And he was called upon to testify against his former boss, the Secretary of War, and technically his current one, the president of the United States, which I should point out here, Custer really did not fucking like Grant. Um, now, Custer at this point had also worked as an unnamed source for the New York Herald, uh, who, who were doing their own investigation into the scandal, though I use the term unnamed source quite lightly, uh, because while he was unnamed in the New York Herald, everybody fucking knew it was Custer. Uh, 
this is due to you know not pe- people not taking secrets and and sources very seriously. And Custer himself could not fucking help himself to be like, I helped take down William Belknap, the Secretary of War. Like, yeah, I was oh man, say, you are no, stupid. There's no way that 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 Custer can deal with a pen name longer than five ten minutes. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like a Gideon Pillow uh, uh, way back uh, in in an episode we did uh, wrote. Uh, complaining about the government and had the pending uh, Leonidas. And everybody's like, that's Gideon Pillow. <laughs> Fucking loser. <laughs> um, now, uh, Custer, again, wasn't a fan of Grant, but he wasn't even uh, less of a fan of Belknap, who he had to deal with more uh, seriously as the Secretary of War. He didn't like a lot of his decisions because Custer believed the easiest way to solve what he dubbed the Native American question. Uh, and to be to be fair, Custer was not the first person to use that term, and it's never a good thing when that term is used. We're um, looking for a solution. A final one, a if final you will. A final one. We've had yeah. many solutions. We just need a final one. Yeah. Um, and he believed the final solution to that was the final solution to that, right. <laughs> where Belknap and Grant were less bloodthirsty at the time. Obviously, Grant launch this uh, manufacture and launch this war so things change uh, also you know all the other shit that he did but he fucking hated them so what what he could have done is uh custer could have gone to this committee uh and uh in dc and told the truth uh because he did witness things that almost certainly were very illegal on fort abraham lincoln um but he couldn't help but like no, he was in the spotlight. So he put on a fucking show and he lied his ass off. Um, now, there's no doubt of anybody's guilt in this scandal. They did this shit and Grant <laughs> was probably connected to it. Uh, I mean, it's not even the first or only scandal that would rock Grant's administration because, again, bad president. Um, was he, but, he was at least an all right dude. Just uh I mean, as far as people of his day before right, he was president. Course. Sure. Um, he did. But he free. When I say he was a good dude, I mean he freed his slaves. I think he had slave singular, uh, if I remember correctly, and he did free him. Um, but he was he was also dirt fucking poor most of his life, which kind of helps make you honest, right? Um, and and kind of helps me like you a little bit more. And then once he was given immense amount of power, he was a genocide <laughs> yeah. yeah, immediately, <laughs> immediately a shithead. Um, but. Now, with being in the spotlight, Custer began to talk about things he had no proof of, things he did not witness, namely implicating the pres- the president's own brother Orville Grant in the scam, which at this point nobody had done. Um, I'm not <laughs> saying that Orville wasn't involved, but what I am saying is Custer had no evidence that Orville was involved because he claimed he saw it. He saw like a deal go down, which implicated Orville Grant, but his commander, General Sheridan, point out that Custer couldn't have seen it because he wasn't even there at that time. Uh, but it did not matter. Custer was virtually a military celebrity at this point. So the press went wild with his testimony. Uh, nobody double uh, nobody double checked or doubted anything he said. They just ran with it. Um, as you can imagine, this would make one the president of the United States quite unhappy with you as a lieutenant colonel, which is never anything that you want to happen. Um, Literally your boss. Yes. Uh, in a much smaller military, may I point. Not to mention, they have known each other because they both fought in the Civil War under the same command. Like, these guys have been in a room together. They've exchanged pleasantries. The world is much smaller back then. Um, especially especially for, like, military age white men. Yes. Uh, who probably know West all of point. them. Yeah. Uh, they would be in the same cir- immediate circle if Grant did not become president, for sure. Uh, the only thing that separated him was, of course, General Stars and the presidency. Um, now, Grant refused to see Custer while he was in D.C. at this point, and so did Sheridan, which seems like something small. However, when Custer went back to Fort Abraham Lincoln, Grant immediately ordered him to be arrested because he ref- he uh, failed to report to his uh, superior commander, that being the president of the United States. Um, while he was in DC, so he kind of set him up for that one. That's uh, um, that's some petty shit, but I'm gonna let it fly because fuck Custer. 
Yeah, I mean, again, how petty does the president of the United? I mean, we've lived through a very petty administration, <laughs> but like uh, setting, doing all of this extra shit to arrest Custer when he could have just arrested him anyway because he lied under oath. And Sheridan's like, "No, he's fucking lying. You could arrest him then." But he's like, "No, no, no. We're gonna we're gonna do this whole elaborate thing so we can arrest him for a different reason." I want him. I want this man to suffer for completely unrelated and bullshit reasons, and that. That's the that's the military kind of shit that I like to see. I like to see I like to see group punishment over the dumbest shit possible. Now at this point, Custer was immediately relieved of command, his command going over to General Terry. Uh, however, Custer was, like I said, kind of a military celebrity. And once wor- uh, word of Grant's punishment got out, a letter writing campaign began, and uh, his fans insisted that he be reinstated. Now this probably would not have worked. I'm willing to give Grant that much that he probably would have ignored it because this would not be the la- the first thing that Grant fucking ignored. Um, however, General Sheridan kind of asked quite nicely, like, hey, we could kind of use him. We're doing a war over here. Uh, we could use a lieutenant colonel who's like has experience because at this point, you know, the, the idiot that we know Custer of in the battlefield doesn't exist yet. These guys know the boy general of the Civil War who's, you know, did some not idiot shit. Again, that was all because he was under the command of somebody else that to temper his worse habits, um, which he will not have very shortly. Um, <laughs> and that is how, at the last minute, Custer was given command of the Seventh Cavalry, the unit which he would destroy. Um, so, like, if Grant told him to fuck off or Sheridan to fuck off, none of this happens. I don't think anybody else leads soldiers into this battle like this. They probably like so uh, go ahead and pump the brakes on this one, but. Custer got put in charge. Now, after Grant's insistence, Custer was only reinstated and allowed to go on this expedition, the Black Hills expedition, which we've been talking about, under the direct supervision of a general, namely General Terry and Crook. Either or, but he'll stay under Terry for a little bit. Now, Sheridan agreed to this. However, when Custer heard about it, he told Sheridan to his face that he would ignore that as soon as he could. <laughs> <laughs> and Sheridan just threw up his shoulders like, all right, what are you going to do? Now, let's talk about the 7th for a second. Um, all right. Famed, Does the 7th Gary Cavalry Allen. still exist? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fort Hood. Yep. All right. When you read about the Battle of the Little Bighorn, they're often noted for being one of the best units out on the plains, which just wasn't true. Not in their current form. Um, just like any other unit, the seventh had a unit history. You know their heraldry, et cetera, et cetera. Their their stories from back in the day, and they stuck to that. And that seems to be what historians were writing about. Um, it, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it would be like the seventh cavalry has since been reconstituted and deployed, and it would be like people like, oh, the seventh cavalry is dog shit because they got wiped out at the Battle of Little Bighorn. Like, well, that was a hundred years ago, so why do we care, right? Um, they had uh, the seventh had done other campaigns, which they did conduct perfectly fine. They'd been out in the plains for quite a while. These soldiers, however, were not those soldiers, and these officers were not those officers. The only thing that remained the same was their fancy red and white cavalry flag said seven. So, the com- completely new group of people. No, are there are there at least veterans in this group, or is it all a f- just uh- a few? Um, a few have stuck around for a while because. Most enlisted men, like enlisted life fucking sucks back then. Um, So people don't stick around very often. uh, And officers live a different existence, right? Like, and not to mention they move around a lot. Uh, Most of these guys experience comes from the Civil War, not Plains Warfare. Though there was people who fought in the other Plains battles and wars that we have talked about. On a long enough timeline, most of those dudes are gone, uh, which was the case. Most of the soldiers in the ranks of the 7th were brand new. Um, Or at least brand new to combat, because there's a difference between staffing some shitty garrison in fucking bumfuck Montana, doing manual labor and trying not to die from typhus and then like actually fighting. Right. Now, the officer corps was honestly the real problem, as it generally is. As as Um, it is. So it goes. um, There is an an equation that I'll bring up in a little bit. Um, Now, the officer corps was faction ridden uh it was tearing itself apart in the seventh and that was because of custer himself and how he commanded every unit he had ever been in he made sure to pull his weight until several generations of his own family were under his direct command and no matter of the rank 
they were in charge of everybody who was not a Custer. So like so this happened so thoroughly that his officer corps was jokingly referred to as a royal family. <laughs> this included no fewer than five different Custers of different generations. Uh, the regimental commander himself, obviously. His brother, Tom, commanded C Company. Another brother, Boston, weird first name there, <laughs> was a civilian hired as a quote-unquote guide, despite the fact he is not from the area. A nephew uh, with the first name Armstrong, whose nickname Audie, fucking weird nicknames back then, was a cattle herder. Like Audie Murphy, Audie? No, uh, Audie's first name, Audie Murphy's first name was Audie, uh, like okay. A-U-D. Uh, IY or something like that. Um, but this is like Audi. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, sure. I, I think Audi Murphy's first name is Audi Murphy. I have to look now. I'm going to be a fucking idiot. Yeah. Audi Leon Murphy. <laughs> yeah. AU, it's A U D I E, right? His brother in law, James or Jimmy uh, Calhoun, was the commander of L Company. Now, all of these people were treated better than everybody else. Even the civilian, again, who was like a cattle cow manager or whatever, and a guide, um, the two civilians are part of the family, who had no military ranks, like Custer would routinely give them messages to give to subordinate commanders, like tell them what to do. Did so they like, not, was there not like a, a private Custer anywhere or a Sergeant Custer? They're all... Why would like, they be enlisted? <laughs> of course not. Just- no, you don't go from being back then. You don't go from being like an illustrious West Point family to having an enlisted guy. That's yeah. how it worked. That makes sense. <laughs> now, now obviously things are much different, but like, sure, much yeah, not happening back then. Um, so like, imagine being like one of his major subordinate commanders, namely like Major Reno or Captain Benteen, who will be very important here. Fucking hated this so-called royal family because. Custer also hated them and he would show their disdain, his disdain for them and how little he thought of them by setting like his nephew cow driver to like, tell them what to do. Like I'm a fucking major. <laughs> <I'm setting> this, <laughs> this asshole cow guy telling me what to do. Uh, I know. Well, speaking let, of his let's, subordinates, let's be honest though. Like, I mean, cow guy farm, like everybody was a farmer. If you weren't, you know, actively doing something. I'm a farmer because that's, I don't have anything else going on. So oh, these guys definitely were not farmers. Uh, the officer, the officer class is not, and, and this goes for Custer's family. We're not farmers. <laughs> like I need to get that straight. They were like administration. Yeah. They were solidly above uh, these people um, above their, definitely their enlisted men and farmers. Uh, you're not going to go from the fields to West Point. Uh, you will go from, however, West Point to the fields, as Ulysses S. Grant would find <laughs> out, because you'd go poor. Uh, but of course, that would not be forever. He'd be president. But um, so let's talk about his direct subordinates. There's Marcus Majorino and Captain Frederick Benteen. Now, they hated Custer almost as much as Custer hated them. And they also hated each other as much as the other routes of hate go here. Uh, now, Benteen, by all accounts, was a decent officer as far as these officers go. Right. Pre- considering the company. Yes. Uh, he, I will say that he showed the most command sense of anybody involved in the situation. <laughs> Reno, one of the worst, uh, not worse than Custer himself, of course, but not good. Uh, but and a lot of the fault of what would happen, what happens from here on out would fall on uh, unfairly on Reno though. I'm not going to defend Reno. He really sucks. Um, But he doesn't deserve all of the blame. Now, another problem with the unit, like I said, were the soldiers themselves. The Civil War veterans that were enlisted were mostly long gone. Uh, I mean, this is quite a long time after the Civil War. Yeah, there might be like an incredibly grizzled old supply guy still around. Most of those dudes are fucking gone. Um, Unlike the officers in their place, was a largely new crop of soldiers had the bare minimum of training, which at the time was not a whole lot. And most of them were recent immigrants to the United States, largely from Ireland. Um, because back then, the U.S. truly did not give a single fuck. They would recruit people literally as they stepped off the boat. Yeah, uh, it's, it, I mean, of course, it helped if you spoke English, but there was more than enough times during the Civil War where they were not that picky. Um, they're like, whatever, sign an X. I'll teach, you, I'll teach you how to shoot a gun. It's fine. I mean, for most of these immigrants, 
life in one of the overcrowded cities and like tenement housing and working awful fucking uh, like jobs was not a bright future. Um, and not to mention that the insane amounts of discrimination is happening to other white people back then. Uh, being in the military was a sweet fucking deal. Uh, you got a government paycheck every month. And as long as you could shovel some shit on the frontier somewhere and suck it up for a couple of years, you had a pension, right? Like, and considering what we've been talking about with these guys, if uh, if the the prospect of like walking your ass across Montana on a regular basis for a couple of years is more, you know, uh, uh, it's just a better idea than like living in one of the cities. That's ooh, not right. a great time like, to be alive. Being like a, a recently uh, uh, or like even black guys, maybe they were they may have been emancipated, but not by much. Uh, like things were, things were quite grim for, uh, for people in the day. And it's like, okay, do I, do I eat shit in the cavalry for a couple of years? Which of course, uh, there, there were black units for it, but most of them were, were white. Um, or do I like, I don't know, go die in a factory fire in New York city. Right. Like those are your options <laughs> or put my, put my small child to work sewing shoes or something. Yeah, until her arm gets ripped off or something. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, being stationed in the frontier in the cavalry was not something that most people wanted to do. Desertion was quite a problem. Um, so so was oh. AWOL. <laughs> Desertions are su- such a problem, their own damn commander keeps going AWOL. <laughs> right. Um, now, pop culture makes, uh, you know, Wild West posting in so-called Indian country look exciting from movies and shit. But... In reality, most of the time, soldiers were spent uh, spent their time doing manual labor in awful conditions in pretty austere frontier forts, where disease occasionally swept through the ranks, killing them. And sometimes they were shot at. Uh, now, this at the end of the day, of course, they would be offered a paycheck. Whereas many recent immigrants in the United States did not have what this is considered luxury, that being food and a government paycheck. Right? Uh, the, sometimes it's aim low right yeah you gotta take what you get man now this this makeup um which of course with the underlying current of racism um there was one irish officer outside of that most people thought very lowly of the irish at this point um so this this as you can tell uh, there's be some problems when it comes to a communication and b how highly you think of your soldiers and therefore give them training there there seems to be a very strong uh I don't give a fuck about you attitude. So mm. like, they were you I, know, I wonder what that's like. Right. Uh they 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 seem to like whatever dig a hole to shit in. We don't need to do rifle drills or anything. They were not well trained. Um I mean I think a fair amount of that is the officers did not think of their own soldiers as Americans. Um and, and, people, and a lot probably yeah and a lot of cases not much more than they thought of Native Americans, which gonna gonna be a, a rough command to be in, right? So not, I'm not saying soldiers fresh out of basic training can't fight. Of course they can. We've literally won wars with them. However, normally there's an equation, which we've talked about vaguely here on the show before. Can a fresh and can a crop of fresh and inexperienced soldiers be led by a decent commander or can good soldiering overcome a bad commander? Like how good does the soldiering have to be to make up for a custer, right? Um, but can a good commander outcommand bad soldiering, right? Like can, can uh, if say if Custer was the most competent man to ever walk through the gates of West Point and he's given a crop of dudes who really don't want to fight or be there, um, could he command them to victory? Or do we have the rare ultra negative, which is can really bad inexperienced soldiers be commanded by a terrible commander and overcome and, and win? No. Uh, I was going to say <laughs> We've gotten one answer here, and yeah. that is no. S- spoiler alert. This does not end <laughs> in an American victory. Um, uh, well, I mean, look who owns most of America and who doesn't. So somebody won. Not Custer. Tell the, you that. Irish. the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> the Irish immigrants who got three squares and a place to sleep. Yeah. Hey, they have the presidency now, all right? It's been a <laughs> long road. Um, now, I'm not, and I'm saying like inexperienced soldiers can't be bad. Um, I, I truly believe that you get bad soldiers from bad command. You can, like not everybody can be a soldier, of course, 
go wash out, go desert, go, like desert or go AWOL or whatever. But these guys could obviously put up with some awful shit. They're still out on the frontier. They could be fine if you actually taught them how to do their jobs and commanded them competently. But yeah. they did none of those things. Or train um, them. I mean, you got a lot of time pounding around the, the nowhere's land here. Teaching them a lot of time. Yeah, like they're not doing anything. <laughs> you got to do this is the, see this is the time before hip pocket training. And it's it's not like they're the soldiers are going to wander off to a porter shitter and watch porn on a tablet and jerk <laughs> off like our generation did. And even to be fair though, being able to go jerk off in a porta potty was probably what kept a lot of people from going AWOL. Endurance training, baby. Now, <laughs> now with that on June 21st, 1876, General Terry sat down with Custer and his other officers to plan their advances towards the Little Bighorn River. Uh, the idea of being a quick moving assault would drive the uh, allied Native Americans from their village right into General Gibbon's force. Uh, the man, not the monkey, um, <laughs> who would act as a blocking unit uh, to catch them as they went away. Now, it is much more adorable if you think of him as a, as a monkey in a military uniform, because Gibbons are small. Um, now, Terry would accompany Gibbon mostly because Custer and Terry, of course, hated each other. Uh, and you know Terry wanted to be as far away from Custer as he could. And Custer wasn't going to object to that fact at all, because that's what he fucking wanted. <laughs> Oh, you want to fuck off? Cool. Now, however, knowing that Terry and Custer hated each other didn't mean that he wanted Custer to fail, right? Because that reflects on him. That's bad for your career. You don't want him to die. So before the two sides set off, Terry offered Custer the entire 5th Cavalry Regiment as reinforcements because he knew as the attacking force, they would need to be bigger, right? Custer turned them down. Uh, people have argued why exactly Custer turned them down ever since. And the best reason I could come up with was if you had another regiment under a different regimental commander with him, even if it was under the unified command of George Custer, it would steal from his and the seventh cavalry's glory. And they of course yeah. inevitably won. Now, f- famously, he also turned down infantry support and a battery of six Gatling guns. A lot has been said about how dumb it was to turn these things down. And honestly, this is the one that makes the most sense to turn down. And please bear with me. People are probably really mad at me right now. <laughs> uh, these at least make sense. The biggest glaring fuck up here is turning down the 5th Regiment of Cavalry, uh, which truly does show how dumb Custer is, along with you know everything else we're about to say. Now, for starters, Custer fought in the Civil War. So he had experience kind of sort of with Gatling guns. Um, and that was they sucked. Um, they had huge problems with reliability. Um, and, and those were true. Like the Gatling guns had a ton of problems. Um, but they would also, these things aren't light. They're towed by a team of horses, so they can't move yeah. very fast. So it, it would slow down his advance as same goes for the infantry, but it would probably slow them down even more. And remember he's cavalry. The whole job of cavalry is to be fast. If you take that away from them, they are functionally point. Um, now, again, he could overcome this little hurdle by, like I said, accepting the help of the 5th Cavalry Regiment, but he didn't because he's very stupid. See, this is what happens when you get more concerned about your personal glory than the mission. You know, like, had he just been like, look, Custer, I understand that we really want to, uh, you want to, you want to make a name for yourself more than you already have. And you want to be, you, you want the, these great stories, but like the mission here is we got to kill a lot of people. Like we just got to massacre some people. And you're not going to be able to do that without some backup. I mean, the easiest answer here is Terry is a, is a spineless fuck. And he could have just said, no, I'm ordering you to take the 5th Cavalry with you. I'm a fucking general. But he didn't. <laughs> I mean, let's not also... Look, as we said, Custer's not the only dumbass in, in all of this. In fact, pretty much everybody is a dumbass. And, I, and, and we should also point out, we're not, in fact, rooting for their victory. We're merely saying... This could have happened. Yeah. <laughs> it's good that they lost. <laughs> it's extremely um, funny. Yeah. It's it's extremely good that the U.S. cavalry was defeated and Native Americans were not genocided in this particular village at that particular day. However, as we're looking through history, we're making fun of Custer at the moment. Now, what was even dumber than all of this is how exactly he planned this, this operation in the first place. During his this planning... Absolutely nobody was worried or cared about the enemy strength of the allied force that might be in front of them. Remember, according to them, at the first sign of battle, Native American warriors would run away, and so would the civilians. Not that they really saw a difference. 
That meant that their only plan of attack was how to catch them when they ran, not how to, you know, fight them. Their whole plan started from step one, they will run. Right. It's the easiest way to think of this. And they're still and they're still under the impression of uh, they will run because they're cowards, not yes, they will run and lead us into getting our our shit pushed in. Despite the fact that that already happened. Yeah. (laughs) Now, it turned out they should have been very worried uh, because the Native American village at Little Bighorn was made up of around a thousand lodges, 7000 people and at least 2000 warriors, which is very large. A bunch. Yeah. This is common as tribes would occasionally move into the area for the warm months, but couldn't stay together for very long. Uh, Their numbers were simply too big. Uh, to live on the countryside. Uh, They would strip it bare. So they could only be there for a very limited amount of time. Um, And this number was further inflated by American military action. Remember, there was a lot of bands of of Native Americans who weren't exactly sold on, you know, war. They wanted to just go about their lives, but then they had their shit raided by by cavalry. And they're like, all right, fuck them. You know, Uh, now I guess I got to do this. Yeah, there was a whole lot of greater unified theory of fuck that guy going on here. Um, On top of, remember, we talked about the Sundance at the the end of the last episode. So this is quite honestly a perfect storm of a village you absolutely do not want to attack. Um, (laughs) It could have not happened at a worse time. If they waited two weeks, the numbers would be half this. Uh, But (laughs) they didn't. (laughs) Because, again, Custer's an idiot. Uh, That meant accidentally on purpose, the U.S. Army would attack at absolutely... It would attack the absolute wrong village at the worst possible time. Um, now, Custer and his men marched down the Rosebud Trail less than 10 days after the battle between Crazy Horse and General Crook that we talked about in the last episode. Now, marching through the area in the baking sun of June kind of sucked. Uh, it's really hot. They're wearing wool cavalry uniforms. And then a dust storm happened. So the soldiers are also going to be quite tired and, and miserable. And the Rosebud Creek snaked back and forth through the valley, meaning like every short amount of distance they do a river crossing uh which is a bitch um and it adds time onto their march custer knew he was getting closer and closer to a large settlement and he wrote on june 24th quote past several large camps the trail is now fresh and the whole valley scratched up by the trailing lodge posts um now however what he didn't notice nor his scouts for that matter for some reasons that are not still entirely clear was the massive amount of horse tracks that was on the road that he was walking down. Like, huh, there seems to be several thousand of these motherfuckers. Um, Must be some wild horses out here. (laughs) Right. Like all of, all of the ones in the entire West took this trail very recently. (laughs) Um, So we'll get some free horses wherever we're going to score. Not only are we going to do a triumphant victory, we're going to have mad horses, fellas. You hear that? (laughs) Now, remember the Sundance ceremony, uh, because of the Sundance ceremony, more and more Native Americans had come to Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse's side, including a large amount of people who had previously already moved on to reservations. These are sometimes called agency, and and you'll you'll see it written as. Um, So Custer knew he was on the right track, but ignored all of the hints that he was coming up against a force he did not want to fuck with uh, because altogether, if he mustered his force in one unit, which spoiler alert, you would not, he only had 700 men. How many more men would he have had with the, uh, the fifth cal- cavalry? It, it would have given him at least a thousand, I believe up against how many, uh, probably around 2000, which probably would have been enough men um, to not get massacred. I'll say it wouldn't be a victory. It'd be more like uh, best case scenario, like the battle of the Rosebud, how that ended where it's like, well, I guess we're going to leave the field now. Uh, Bye. Like, (laughs) are we, are we done here? Can we be done stabbing each other? Cool. We're going to go. We're kind of, kind of out of ammo. It's kind of hot. We're going to hit the old dusty trail, you know, (laughs) but uh, remember he wasn't trade. He wasn't planning for a battle. He was planning for a trap. There wasn't going to be a battle. They were simply too cowardly or whatever. Remember, there wasn't going to be a battle. He was simply going to drive them into General Gibbon's arms. So again, he changed his plan to reflect this. He ordered a detour to go around the Rosebud Creek and uh, to make sure this uh, Native American village or or armed group, whatever he believed he was coming up on, we're not entirely sure because, you know, dead. Um, 
he didn't know the size or location of couldn't escape. He's 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 planning the his victory parade. He's not even planning how to get there. <laughs> he called his officers together and Custer outlined a new plan. Instead of continuing up um, the Rosebud, he would follow a trail across the divide under the cover of night, spending the next day resting his soldiers and fixing the location of this uh, village via forward scouting. Uh, he then planned on a dawn attack on June 26th because the 26th is when General Gibbon was scheduled to be at the mouth of the Little Bighorn as his blocking force. So again, planning from the end to the beginning. He's backwards planning, but in the dumbest way possible, I guess. I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm not going to say that backwards planning doesn't you know, work in some scenarios, but also some forward planning would have probably helped. <laughs> yes, you can't have time. backwards planning without also <laughs> forward planning. He built the second floor of a house without yeah, right. planning on stairs. Now, this movement, however, would require his soldiers to immediately move. Uh, like, and this is the middle of the night where it's like midnight. So you can, everybody immediately got kicked awake and we're forced to march six miles up a fucking countryside mountain uh, that nobody could see. It's like 2 a.m. There's like very little moonlight. Flashlights don't exist yet. <laughs> People Bro, are just I like almost, tri- tripping over themselves. <laughs> I almost quit the army when they made my ass march 12 miles in any direction. It should so, suck. Yeah. It's fucking like I am public affairs. I do not do this. And uh, drill sergeants don't take that as an answer, as it turns out. So, well, I uh, was in cavalry units for most of my career, and I can confirm it still sucks. <laughs> um, and it, they ended up having to call off the night march early because like a couple guys fell down the fucking side of the hill. Like, oh, all right, well, we should probably wait. Uh, they wait until 8 a.m. Uh, and not because. This was planned, but because Custer's scouts, who were smart and climbed a nearby mountain known as the Crow's Nest uh, to scout, reported that they saw a what they believed to be a Sioux village about 15 miles away. Though they didn't know that there was way more than just Sioux in there, and they probably didn't see the entire village because it was so big. It was probably they couldn't see it all. Because if they did see the whole thing, they'd probably be like, well, time to run. Uh, we're not sticking around for this one, boys. <laughs> Uh, and I'm giving them a very charitable benefit of the doubt because even if, if Custer was given a realistic uh, scouting report on this, even he probably would have said no. Uh, and that's, again, giving him the most charitable uh, uh, interpretation of what happened. I mean, the man was a racist. He was full of himself, but he wasn't suicidal. Like, if he would have saw the breath of this village, he'd be like, ooh, I should probably call for my for my re- reinforcements <laughs> like he had at least sort of double tapped the brakes before before going in yeah where, where's my where's my fifth bring him bring yeah, him in exactly uh now custer wanted to see the village for himself uh so he climbed up to the crow's nest and so he could you know plan out this attack on the village but by the time he got there the sun had risen which you know burns off far fo- or like the dew on the grass and creates fog and valleys and it blanketed the whole area he couldn't see the village at all now, the scouts also told him something else. They had seen people on horseback they knew to be probably Sioux, maybe Lakota, whatever, um, moving through the, uh, the, the, like the neighboring mountains. So they had to have seen us. They didn't. They just assumed. But they're like, if they haven't found us, they will any second. Sure. Now, for anybody else who isn't foundationally the dumbest man on earth, <laughs> this would have meant like, the attack has to be called off, right? I can't see the village. I don't know how big the village is. I don't know how many people are in it. We've been found. So our, our element of surprise is ruined. It's like you're running a checklist down on like what not to do. do right. Do I continue this? You know, and then it's it, all signs. point. You, you're shaking, you're shaking the magic eight ball and it's saying uh, all signs point to no. <laughs> Yeah, uh, not not to mention like a cavalry attack without surprise is pretty pointless. However, again, that wasn't how anybody in the army thought. Instead, to them, it meant, hey, if they saw me, they're going to pack up and run. Not that they're going to attack me. Right. They're going to pack up and run. So we must now attack immediately so we can catch them. He didn't think for an example that they were preparing for battle or they were capable of putting up a defense or an organized counteroffensive, uh, 
uh, or anything in between. I mean, to be to be clear here, the village actually had no idea he was coming. They, they, those were not their scouts. And if they were their scouts, they didn't see shit. Because um, he did have an element of surprise. So uh, to Custer, he meant, we got to go now. to Stop the village from fleeing. This, this meant he couldn't plan anything, really. Not to mention he, he couldn't really plan anything. He couldn't see the village. Um, and because of racist doctrine... He thought he was on a time crunch. He couldn't send any more scouts out either. He, just, he didn't have time for anything, right? Uh, so he simply decided to order his entire regiment forward against a target he could not see. That's cool. That's normal. Normal thing you do. And what happened next was probably, in reality, the final nail in, in Custer's coffin. And, you know, hundreds of his men. Um, and the regiment was formed into battalions, and then the battalions would be split up. Um, now, who was leading what battalion would end up determining if they lived or died. Major Reno commanded one battalion consisting of companies M and A, around 140 men. Yeah, I know these numbers are weird when you compare them to modern unit sizes. Um, Captain Benteen led another, companies H, D, and K, for a total of 125 men. Companies E and F were under Captain Yates, and uh, C. I and L were under Captain Kehoe, who was uh, the only Irish officer in the unit. That was a total of 225 men, and they remained under Custer's direct control. They were all fucked. <laughs> Being, <laughs> if you were under Custer's direct command the situation, you were doomed. Uh, of course, you know, they don't know that yet. Uh, Benteen was set off to, uh, to uh, recon a nearby ridge to make sure uh, the Native Americans had not already began to escape into the upper Bighorn River. However, Benteen completed his mission pretty quickly because nobody was running. So he, uh, he just didn't tell Custer. Benteen, like I said, fucking hated Custer. Remember, he thought Custer was just a huge dumbass, uh, and he really did not have any faith in Custer's command. This ended up... And he was also not wrong. <laughs> yeah, this ended, probably ended up saving Benteen's life. So he, uh, rather than telling Custer or sending a runner forward to be like, hey, we've completed our mission. What do you want us to do? He simply ordered his men to slowly begin walking back towards the main force. Didn't tell anybody. Wasn't in a rush. They were just like plodding along. Uh, Homer Simpson into the bushes. <laughs> now, this gave Reno and Custer enough time to get a full three miles ahead of him. At this point, the unit's local guide and interpreter pointed out that he saw some warriors running away, which he didn't. Um, if he did, they weren't warriors and they didn't see the, the white guys there. Because again, surprise did happen. Custer and Reno took off after them and the chase went on for another three miles before it was broken up. But not before Custer saw some dust and what he thought was smoke rising from uh, behind a nearby bluff, which the amount of smoke told him like, that's a village. Like that's our village. That's where we need to go. So he immediately ordered Reno to attack it, telling him he would be supported by quote, the whole outfit. He would not. (laughs) (laughs) Instead, as soon as he gave that order, Custer took five companies off to the right as Reno moved forward. This is again, based on the idea that the village would flee uh, as soon as Reno's attack of remember only like 120 dudes, hit the side of the village, he would need to be a blocking force to keep them within that village and start shooting at them. So that's where he was planning to move his soldiers as another blocking force. This is despite the fact he had literally just told Reno that he would be supported. Reno would never get any support during his attack. He immediately moved to not do that with everybody else. I I, I mean, I don't think it's... Be- he wasn't sabotaging Reno. I, obvious, I honestly just don't think Custer knew what the fuck to do. By the time Custer and his men even got to their positions on the opposite side of the village, Reno was already attacking the village, so a lot of help that did. According to one of Custer's Crow scouts, quote, down the valley, there were camps and camps and camps. There was a big camp in the circle near the West Hills. We could see Reno fighting, and everything was a scramble with a lot of Sioux. Um, They were not running. At this point, Custer could clearly see that. He decided to just sit there. Well, so so his... he. He was just so like, they're not doing the thing that we expected them to do. And I have no idea what to do now. He could have done that or he could have been like, ah, they'll start running anytime now. (laughs) Like, and no good answer here, really. So now with Custer's unit already technically being in battle that because, you know, Reno's under his command, uh, Custer hadn't actually planned on what to do next. So he passed orders for the supply train, which he had left behind 
um, to move forward because it carries all the ammo. And he knows that, oh, we're, oh boy, we're going to be using a lot of ammo. Look at how big that village is, right? Um, all while Reno's force of a little over 100 men was fighting what was now quickly turning into thousands of warriors who Reno was also probably seeing now were not running away. <laughs> They're running at me with guns. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so notably like the, the baggage train didn't show up and also Custer began to wonder where the fuck is Benteen at? Like where, like, did he fucking run away? What's going on here? So he sent a runner to Benteen and, uh, he ordered Benteen to like to move up, hurry up and bring the ammunition train with him. Benteen was like, nah, (laughs) it just kept moving real slowly. Um, but he did pick up the baggage train. Because, uh, you know, he also was coming to the conclusion that he was also going to need ammo. Now, at this time, Custer sent another runner with a note that read, quote, Benteen, come now, big village, be quick, bring packs, signed W.W. Cook. P.S. Bring packs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th- I don't think Cook meant to put that twice. I think he was just writing it so quickly that he, he didn't re- really mean, realize what he was writing. When you say packs, you mean P.A.X., right? Uh, As in bring it, it people? Was, now, one is spelled P A C K, as in bring the packs. You could probably think of like that's supply train, and the other is P A C S. Uh, imagine the, that one or the other means personnel. Um, however, W uh, W Cook, by the way, is Custer's adjutant, um, and you know um, Benteen would have known that. Like this is now my like the lieutenant colonel's yelling at me to hurry the fuck up. Uh, and we do know about this because this physical order survived because you know Benteen survived. As Custer moved into position, he split his command again. He sent Yates's two company uh, battalion galloping down the Medicine Trail Coulee. Uh, uh, Coulee is some kind of drainage valley. Um, I guess that's a verbiage they use in the area towards the Little Big Horn. And he posted Captain Kehoe's three company battalion in dismounted positions on a ridge separating Medicine Trail from the next Coulee to the north, called the very imaginally called the Deep Coulee. Now, the idea was that this force close to the village would now threaten the warriors who were attacking Reno. And they'd be like, oh, shit, there's some behind us. We have to peel back and attack them or they're going to come into the village, which would theoretically relieve Reno. It didn't work. And I should point out here that Reno was getting the shit kicked out of him. Now, Reno, as soon as he rode up on the village, he saw how big it was and was like, oh, dear fuck. And he realized (laughs) that he could not attack it. Uh, now, he also realized he could not retreat. He had his orders, which is stupid at this point. You should probably break off the attack. But also because as soon as the warriors saw, you know, 120 dudes galloping the set down the side of a hill, they were like, oh, shit, look, white people are here. And they ran out to fight him. So he could not pull back. Uh, he was now uh, too engaged in battle to really do anything other than fight. Uh, he ordered his men to dismount in a skirmishing line. And according to... Standard military doctrine of the time, this formation, every fourth trooper would be uh, holding the reins of horses for the other troopers in the firing position with every five to 10 yards separating each trooper. The officers were to the rear of the firing line and the horses were behind them. Now, they were already very, very badly outnumbered. Now, when you deploy this standard tactic, you reduce your numbers even further because while you're holding the horses, you can't shoot. Yeah, but I'm going to go ahead and take horse holding duty. It doesn't really matter at this point. Uh, uh, things get pretty chaotic pretty quickly. A lot of the horses get shot. When I, when I say that, I mean, I'm behind the officers and now I'm fucking leaving on a horse. Yeah, that's a good call. Like, nobody's looking. Time to go. I got four horses. They can't even chase me. Who are they going to? Who's going to believe them? They're all going to be dead. Oh, he went AWOL. Did I? No, I just survived. Fuck Prove y'all. it. Yeah. I didn't go AWOL. I was a survivor. Uh, now, Remember, Reno thought there was around 600 more soldiers that were supposed to be running in directly behind him to support him. So he held that skirmish. I was like, well, they'll be coming any second now. Any second now, boys. Don't worry. Oh, oh, oh God. Oh, no. Yeah, it, it didn't work. Um, it didn't now, come. Back. <laughs> the soldiers never came. They never came. <laughs> now, back with Custer, his plan may have worked. But also probably not with like relieving Reno. Uh, it really seems like the native warriors did see him, but they're like, hey, he's not shooting at us. 
Fuck we got, yeah, we got guys shooting at us over here. Let's deal with those guys first. You know, we sense. got these idiots standing in the middle of the field. Let's go get them. Now, Ben Teen had still not shown up. <laughs> uh, and, you know, Custer was getting kind of worried. Uh, and, and Reno's line then got flanked by a, an attack on the right. Now, this broke them, uh, that broke their skirmish line and forced them to fall back into a nearby grove of trees to kind of protect their flanks a little better. And then everything went sideways. Reno lost his ability to command because Bloody Knife, who was Reno's uh, native scout and apparently a very, very close friend of his, got shot in the fucking head. Um, And it splattered brains directly into Reno's mouth. (laughs) So he was too busy throwing up. (laughs) That shock, you know, the overall ew. Uh, Right. The, The realization of, oh, fuck, I'm about to die. Yeah, like that's going to be my brain soon. Uh, this caused him to uh, kind of have a bit of a mental breakdown and order a full on retreat. Now, whether this was ordered or implied is kind of not known. Um, according to some people, it seems like Reno just turned and ran and everybody's like, oh, fuck, we got to keep up. Or other people said that he did order it, which does make sense. Um, it's not super uncommon for officers to pass orders and warfare back then and just other people just not get them. So that's uh, like, which is why one of uh, a very important part of the training is like, hey, if you see your line doing something, just follow them. Right. Um, which honestly, it still kind of tracks, right? Do, um, yeah, do what everybody else is doing. Um, when in doubt, follow everybody else. Right. Now, uh, this second retreat uh, was completely without order and it seemed to be more of a route. Uh, and they fell all the way back to the first hilltop where Custer had first scout of the valley. And this position would become known as Reno's Hill. Obvious reasons. Then Benteen finally showed up. Not hey. to Custer, though. He showed up alongside Reno and all the guys who just survived the first firefight. Like, man, you guys look like you got fucked up. What happened out here? Um, <laughs> he did bring the ammo and he joined Reno there, deciding not to advance any further because he had seen the condition of Reno's men. And remember, Reno had seen the full scope of the village and thousands of fighters so he's like do not fucking go down there like this place is huge we do not have enough people and ben team honestly was just like yeah it's good call you should probably not do that uh so they dug in on the hilltop uh so these guys get a lot of blame for what happens next and you can blame reno for a lot i don't you can blame ben team for a lot because it took him so long to get there Uh, i don't know fuck custer i guess that's that's that is not a good thing to do if you're Ben Teen, especially because, you know, soldiers are in combat. But but let I mean, look, sure, there maybe there were maybe there were problems. But like the the original problem still goes way back to Custer. Yeah, like he's the gene seed of all of the problems in this yeah. immediate situation. But yeah, Ben Teen parked on the hill and they dug in. And it's not like they skipped out of combat or anything like they would be pinned down on that hill for the entire day. Um, they just would not take part in what happens next, which is, of course, the most famous part of the battle. Now, Custer, back in his position next to the village, realized that, uh, oh, he is alone, and the entire enemy force is now reeling back around towards me. This is where things get kind of hazy, as Custer's force launch into a fighting retreat up into a flat hill, now known for obvious reasons as Custer's Hill. But uh, along the way, a lot of the, it seems like most of the battalion's horses got shot out from under them, or they ran off. Um, there's also one warrior named white bull cow or white cow bull seen it in both ways claim. He shot a man in the back who was wearing a buckskin jacket and he saw him fall off of this horse. Custer famously dressed that way. His other soldiers didn't. Now his claim does not make he's any a, sense. He's the native American Makuya. <laughs> it, it, his, his claim does not make a ton of sense. No other warriors claims match his. Um, and, but indisputably, Custer died on his hill. That's where his body was found, uh, not on the way there. It's been thought of that Custer could have been wounded on his way, gotten back up, or dragged there by his men. However, Custer suffered only two bullet wounds, one to his head and one to his heart, meaning both of them would have been fatal. He never would have made it back to his hill. Not to mention, there's like a dozen warriors who say, yep, Custer was definitely fighting on the hill. So... Mm-hmm. Homeboy's full of shit. That's my final judgment on him. (laughs) Now, back on his hill, Custer would have seen that he was well and truly boned, outnumbered in every direction with no escape. 
and the and the hill that he had chosen, the heat of the moment, of course, he's not planning anything. They're just fucking firing from the hip here was too small. All of his men couldn't fit on the top of it. So like eh, they just kind of formed ad hoc units and defenses in the immediate area. Now the warriors began their advance. And this is one of the parts that honestly just bone chilling. So they have these things called war whistles. Now famously, most people think of like the Aztec war whistle because it sounds like a human being screaming and it's legitimately horrifying. These were more like just an ear piercing shriek. Um, And there were thousands of them. Mm. Uh, It just like a high pitched shrieking noise as they advanced. And not to mention you're on there. You're on a hill. Native Americans know how to fight in this terrain. They're hiding in in the tall grass and scrub brush and whatever. You can't see them. And you're just this. The the grass is screaming at you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when the when the trees start speaking Vietnamese or when the grass starts screaming at you, one or the other, you're boned. Yeah, when the grass starts screaming at you in, <laughs> in, in Lakota, it's time to shit your britches. <laughs> Good thing I wore my brown pants. <laughs> As the warriors closed in, they deployed a tactic that listeners of the show might be familiar with, though I will point out that uh, military tacticians and historians don't give Native people credit for deploying this because of racism. And that is the classic Finnish moti or mati, uh, or you should probably consider it the Native American moti because this out this predates it by a hundred years. <laughs> what is what is moti? It's generally what happens when you pick apart a smaller for or a larger force by encircling it bit by bit. Okay. The Finns uh, famously deployed this expertly during the Winter War against the Soviet Union. And I know we have a lot of new listeners recently. Go back and listen to the Winter War series. We talk about a lot. But generally, though, in this situation, it's a much bigger force doing it to a much smaller force. And the reason why they did that is because once you separate the cavalry force up, they can't mask their fire, which mm-hmm. they were still good at. Like Even badly trained soldiers in the day still knew how to fire in a volley, which if you're charging a line of soldiers firing from trapdoor weapons, you're going to have a bad time. Um, so by encircling these small units, making sure that they cannot link back up to make a bigger one and slowly snuffing them out before moving on and doing that same thing repeatedly is, in my opinion, a Mahdi or a Modi. Um, my, my Finnish pronunciation is flawless. I'll hear no, I'll hear no dissent. So that's, in my opinion, that's what they deployed. That's what it seems like they deployed when you look at like warrior accounts. Um, now, as the remains of the seventh made their way up the hill, they weren't able going to fit. They weren't all able gonna, uh, to, to be able to fit. And they, they realized that finally. So there was no battalion wide orderly last stand. It was impossible. Uh, so they began breaking down into piecemeal. Uh, some formed lines. Maybe they had like an NCO that was still alive and could command them to hold their shit together. Others were, according to eyewitnesses, uh, and by eyewitnesses, I mean, you know, obviously the Native Americans, there were no American (laughs) eyewitnesses that survived. Terrified gaggle of men that were just didn't want to die. And uh, they they were generally the first to go. Uh, The warriors moved only so fast as they could surround one of these at a time. Um, and then one by one, they snuffed them out. Though it wasn't like an encirclement followed by a charge. It was like they would very clearly encircle them at a distance and then kind mm-hmm. of pick them off um, until it was clear that they'd been weakened, demoralized, and they could be easily overwhelmed. But they always made sure to target the horses first, which while I support the the clear hatred at horses because they're evil, um, what they the real reason for it was they knew cavalry kept all of their additional ammunition on saddlebags on the horses. So, and not to mention, it's quite hard to kill a horse with a rifle back then. Horses are quite hardy. They knew if they shot a horse, it would run off. Which also, yeah, it's, which also, you know, still uh, gets you your goals. Yeah, you separate them from their ammo, and now they're not getting on a horse and trying to run away. Like they're going to, they only can go as fast as their little feet will take them, which generally isn't going to be very fast, right? They've already been sprinting through the scrub brush in June heat. Like they're not in like tip top physical condition at this point. 
Now, some of these men joined together separate from Custer on Custer's Hill. This included the remains of forces led by Kehoe, Yates, and Calhoun, where they would defend what would become known as Calhoun's Hill, which is generally considered to be right next to Custer's Hill, but in reality, it's about a half mile away. So, like, it's quite... At this point, in this reality, that might as well be in a different fucking country. You're not mm-hmm. going to make it a half mile. Uh, they, they might as well be separated by a fucking ocean. From what unfolded next, we only have one side, obviously. Um, however, uh, from the outside looking in, uh, the attacking warriors and their firsthand accounts, what happened next was not a epic brave last stand. Though, I will say, there were incidents of last stands because it, be, it was very, very clear to the soldiers like, oh boy, they are not taking prisoners. <laughs> like, <laughs> surrender is not not to mention that was quite uncommon for them anyway like neither side in this conflict was known for their uh hospitality when it came to prisoners of war and again i do not blame native american warriors for being very thorough on their on their killing like these people were their mission was to wipe you out like you're not gonna like oh well no let, you, let, me, let me get you three hots and a cot like i'm gonna brain you yeah. like, well well we're gonna we're gonna have a, a prisoner swap later on. Um, we're just gonna swap the body parts that we've all hacked <laughs> yeah. off of our prisoners. Bit by bit, yeah. <laughs> um, now cornered and in their final positions, the warriors still did not charge in. The troopers had the high ground, and it would have made a fucking bloodbath, even if the warriors uh, would have overwhelmed them with numbers. Like it's not a price they wanted to take. They're they're not gonna get up close and personal with a skirmishing line. That's they're gonna sit back and they're gonna. Pick you apart yeah. bit by bit. They don't need. They don't gotta. Why? why you know. Why they, would they? You, you have already handed it to them, man. Like, yeah, there are these people on the hill are already dead. They just don't know it yet, right? Um, and not to mention, again, the high ground. Right? They think they have a tactical advantage, which type, they kind of do, but they actually lost. Uh, one of the one of the elements that they lost to was was inferior technology because. Up on that hill, on the high ground, Native American warriors like, we'll just arc arrows in on them. <laughs> we can't shoot at them. And th- so that's what they did. They arced arrows over the hill and onto the formation of soldiers that were gathered in the middle, which oh, no. they had no cover from. No, <laughs> they, they didn't really bring shields out to the uh, the middle of nowhere, did they? Yeah, a shield wall in the late 1800s is picking up the E1 and putting them above your head. <laughs> Now, what what broke one of many of the small defenses was a charge from the north led personally by Crazy Horse. Um, Now, Crazy Horse, of course, himself will say this ended the battle, which it ended part of it. Um, Like Custer had no command ability over his entire force. And what Crazy Horse probably did is break one element of it. He didn't take out, uh, by all accounts, nobody's really sure who killed Custer. But this wasn't the last stand of Custer himself. This is just an element of the people on the hill. Um, each unit or group of people, unit cohesion was long since dead at this point, uh, kind of made their own last stand. A group of men from F and E companies decided to fuck this shit. And uh, they jumped on a few surviving horses and attempted to break out, but were killed before long. Uh, quote, we finished up this party right there in that ravine, said a warrior named Red Horse, which is like, hundred yards away. They didn't make it very far on the hilltop. There was, it was total chaos and uh, Custer and around 40 of his men, give or take uh, formed their own last stand. Uh, and they made defenses out of their own dead horses. Some of whom they, they shot right then and there to, to make into, into cover. <laughs> very, very reminiscent of uh, the, uh, the, the wall at the hot gates is being like, Oh, we're going to use dudes as mortar. We use horses <laughs> as cover, we, or in Romecast, you know your homie raft. Got to make yeah. a raft out of homies. That's right. Homie, homie, <laughs> homie, homie. There you go. What are horses what but ho- four-legged homies? Yeah, it's just a homie you can ride. <laughs> God damn it! It's a homie going to get you to go uh, get you places where you need to be. Locomotive homie. Exactly. Um, Transportation. Yeah. Trans- <laughs> oh, many different kinds of homies. These are just <laughs> transportation homies. <laughs> If uh, things get bad, they can become food homies, you know? <laughs> uh, they're also ammunition homies. Um, yeah, whatever whatever we need them to be. They're also, yeah. uh, I don't want to be in this war right now, so I'm going to stand in the back and hold on to these homies. homies. 
<laughs> According to uh, everybody is different time frames and how long this battle uh, took, which makes sense. Anybody uh, who's ever read firsthand accounts of soldiers in war uh, will uh, they have wildly different um, conceptions of time while under stress and fire. Uh, and there's no reason to believe that uh, the Native Americans didn't also experience that. Well, what? And I can also agree uh, to to that idea of what you believe took ten minutes probably took thirty seconds. The firefight that you think lasted two hours probably took ten minutes. You know, um, it, your brain just doesn't work well when people are a- actively attempting to murder you. And it doesn't matter how <laughs> like hardcore you are; like it's, your your brain goes into fucking lizard mode. <laughs> Fucking goblin mode, baby. Go in goblin mode, and by that I mean killing the cavalry. <laughs> <laughs> this is when the natives really want goblin mode. <laughs> uh, now, according to some people and according to some warriors, uh, this took two hours from start to finish. Um, though to others, only a couple minutes. Uh, not even the warriors' own accounts on this, and there's a lot of conflicting accounts on what exactly happened during Custer's true last stand. Or even how well the troopers stood and fought. According to some, like Crazy Horse said that they like ran, broke down for their lives, dropping their weapons and, and you know pleading for their lives. Uh, other people say that didn't happen at all. Uh, Horn Bear and Iron Hawk say that soldiers stood shoulder to shoulder and fought to the bitter end to the last bullet. Uh, and again, this all could be true. There could have been groups that were like, yo, fuck this. We'll, we'll, we'll do whatever <laughs> you want. Don't kill us. And there's others that probably fully realized what was going to happen to them, and they went down fighting. Yeah, uh, the, it, there's a kaleidoscope of different kinds of murder happening on this hill at the same time. Newer research on the site show that there was probably, in the end, three different groups on the hill. Each of them kind of putting up a fight. Uh, they were surrounded by a lot of empty shell casings and ammo, um, and all of them cut off from one another again on purpose because that's what they were doing. Um, and the warriors' main goal is to make sure they could not link back up, and they slowly tighten the noose. So most of the hundred or so warriors that are thought to have been killed in the battle, according to Crazy Horse, uh, were killed assaulting Custer's final position, and that's because this, you know, the immediate command uh, structure around him had held up, and that meant that they could order volley fire which is not something you want to run into on an open hilltop is guys behind, you know, meat filled sandbags of horse corpses unloading volley fire into you is, is a bad time. And this is still, is this still the time when rifles take like a minute to reload or do we have a little bit faster reloading kind of? So these were trap door rifles. So they weren't bolt action. Of course, bolt action rifles weren't, weren't a thing yet though. They're firing much faster. Um, like, uh, I, I forget for exactly the type of Springfield, but they fire, they drop down a trap door, they insert another cartridge, they close the trap door and they can fire again. So it's kind of, okay, but it's not a rolling block, which is different. I don't believe so. I'm not enough gun nerd to, to okay. say. Uh, but yeah, it's, they, they're they shooting much faster. They're not shooting uh, like uh, muzzle loading muskets or gotcha. anything like okay. that. They have cartridges that they're loading in. Here. Yes. Now, okay. there were certainly some muzzle-loading uh, muskets floating around the native ranks. They also had trapdoor rifles. Um, I saw one report that said the Native Americans actually had more trapdoor rifles or more advanced trapdoor rifles than the, than the soldiers did uh, due to like buying and selling guns from frontiersmen. Somehow there was a bunch of Mosin Nagants out there. They're just in every war. Yeah, crazy for some horse loading a belt into his 240 Bravo they had uh, mounted on his horse's head. Yeah, now that's technical. Now that's, now that is some fan art I would like to see. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and like there's also a lot of reports said that the trapdoor rifles uh, were, were awful. Um, they were being fired so much that they overheated and caused the cartridges to swell and jam. And then you, know, you have to pull them out with a knife. So you can load the next one and do it again, which that was partially true from my understanding, uh, but certainly not the entire problem. There was there was a time frame where they attempted to blame everything other than Guster, and the rifle was one of those things. Which, like all of those things, can be true at once. You got to perform your sports, man. Slap, pull, <laughs> observe, release, tap, and get shot. I guess. In this situation, sports uh, the S starts with surrender, and you just go <laughs> from there. Uh, now, uh, some warriors have said that uh, Custer's true epic last stand lasted less than 15 minutes, which probably was true. 
um, due to the sheer amount of humanity attempting to kill him on the hilltop. Um, now, what Crazy Horse saw uh, that he claimed was the entire force breaking and running was probably the last breakout attempt of around 28 men. Uh, they only made it like a, a football field away from Custer's Hill. Um, now, after fin- finishing off Custer's men, which again, didn't take that long, they circled right back around and attacked Reno and Benteen, who were still dug up on Reno's Hill, completely unaware of what was happening over on Custer's Hill. Now, Reno apparently froze under the assault, leaving command to Benteen, which he commanded in person, running around the lines from position to position, rifle and sword in hand and fighting yeah. until the sun rose the next day. So like in comparison, Benteen is much but, better commander for Reno. Yeah, we're not I'm not going to I'm not going to like, you know, celebrate any of these guys, but like I will at least say you died with the sword in your hand, quite literally. Well, he didn't die, right? Benteen survived. Oh, Ben Benteen doesn't die. No, Reno and Benteen's hill holds. Um because, you know, one, they focused a lot of their attack on Custer, and by the time they got to fully assaulting their position, they're pretty worn out. They've suffered a fair amount of casualties themselves. And Reno and Benteen had time to dig in and form firing lines, and they quickly learned, like, holy shit, this sucks. Like, you know, assaulting a, a well led, organized defense is a tall fucking offer when you, they have the high ground. We're not going to be able to pull this whole hill thing off twice. Um, so they eventually broke off their attack and withdrew. And, uh, you know, another part of that is probably rightly is that crazy horse is like, hey, if this battle continues, they're going to get reinforcements. um, And that's bad for us. We need to get the fuck out of here. Now, once they pulled back into the village, they immediately set fire to the surrounding brush so they could put up a smoke screen. They packed their bags and got the fuck out of there Uh, because everybody was well aware that like after standing on that hilltop covered in dead cavalry troopers, like, oh, boy. (laughs) Questions. <laughs> hey, we need to get the fuck out of here, boys. Like, this is going to be a bad time for us when the blue blue jackets show back up or whatever, you know? Now, by the morning of the 27th, uh, June 27th, General Terry and his men arrived, all of them wanting to know, hey, where's Custer? Every, <laughs> whenever Custer's not on screen, everybody should be asking, <laughs> where's Custer? So this is, hey, this is like the anniversary of uh, Custer getting whacked. It's, the, it's June 28th that we're uh, uh, recording yep. this. Yeah, uh, uh, this mission almost started on my birthday. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure when this is going to be coming up, but we almost did this on time. Uh, mark it down. That counts for us because we always fuck this up. It like doesn't every, matter. Every what, December, what is- someone's like, are you going to do Pearl Harbor this month? Like, nah, probably not. Uh, I do these things like three months at a time. <laughs> what's what's going to what, what do you think? History is going to change, guys. It's fine. We'll get to we'll get to your favorite, you know, military fuck ups whenever. The good news is, is Custer is still dead. Um, uh, so uh, nobody was sure what had happened to Custer yet Reno and Benteen did not want to venture out from their positions for obvious fucking reasons Um, but the battlefield over on Custer's Hill was discovered the morning of the next day by some scouts with one of them describing it as quote a scene of ghastly sickening horror Uh, which accurate fair Um, the the Native American warriors had done a fucking number on these corpses as they generally like they do that. All right. Uh, they're dead. Who? Why does it matter? Uh, like they're not They're not feeling it anymore unless they did, in which case you won't feel it for very long. Um, I mean, I simp- figure. So, so they, I mean, you said that they had to leave, so they didn't. Yeah. How much time did they really like devote to uh, time to do some, some mutilate? Mutilation. Quite a, quite a bit. Uh, I mean, oh, okay. like they had, they fought Benteen and uh, Reno on his hill for several hours after Custer had been wiped out. Okay, so you have your fighting group, and then you have your corpse desecration group. Yeah, you get to you get to send in your 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 desk uh, corpse mutilation corps. I don't know, like get in <laughs> there, boys, cut them up good. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's mortuary affairs. Yeah. <laughs> I came for the Sundance and my MOS is Mortuary Affairs. We'll hold back. We'll get you some white people uh, in no time. Uh, not to mention they've been sitting out in the sun in June. Mm. Uh, just crispy. Always gross. Yeah, they've been bloated uh, from the sun. Uh, now Custer managed to escape being scalped. Uh, all of the first people on scene said that his body was free of mutilation. Now, uh, he, Do we though believe he was, that? He was found completely naked, though. So he got his <laughs> shit ran through. 
people stole all of his shit, which is fun. And uh, okay. to be fair, that's most of them. Like, is it mo- most of their corpses were robbed blind, which again, they don't need that shit. Now, one of the reasons why I believe the accounts that Custer was unmutilated is because one of the accounts comes from a Cheyenne civilian. Um, and there were a lot of civilians present on the Hill. Um, one of the things that happened was as the greater Native American force advanced, civilian women came up behind them and killed the wounded by braining them with rocks. Um, so there, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and get in there. It's good to involve everybody, you know? Community defense. You know? Exactly. Yeah, you know, you've heard of you've heard of picking it up by your bootstraps, but sometimes you gotta set it down with a rock. <laughs> Sometimes sometimes a problem is solved with a rock. Now, this Cheyenne woman was named uh, Kate Bighead, who said, Kate Bighead said, the women then pushed the point of, so- of a sewing awe into each of his ears and into his head. This was done to improve his hearing. As <clears throat> it seemed, he had not heard what our chiefs in the South had said when he smoked pipe with them. Um, and she also says that she stopped... Um, other warriors from mutilating him by saying like she was related to him. I don't know why exactly. Uh, I think it's, be- I think it's because she recognized him um, after and wanted, and wanted to mutilate out. him herself with the, yeah, yeah, with, like, so, okay. Makes sense. No, 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 don't no, This is a nobody. Don't touch him. This like, one's all me, baby. <laughs> now, uh, a lot of this has to do has been interpreted. Her words have been interpreted as, you know, because of the belief and reasoning for mutilation is you take that damage with you in the afterlife, in the next world, whatever. And she believed that his ears were obviously closed because he hadn't heard what the chief had said. And if I jam the sewing needle into his fucking ear, his dumb ass will hear things better in the afterlife, Um, which I would like to believe is true because there's nothing better than a a post-mortem burn. Now, as news reached the rest of the U.S., this obviously turned into a bit of a thing. Um, <laughs> can't, can't let this one go untouched. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, you know, several hundred soldiers being uh, killed didn't happen very often. Um, and the front page of the New York, New York Times read in all caps, massacre of our troops. And they were not alone. Um, yeah, this was quite shocking to the conscience of the, uh, the white people who believed that the, the manifest destiny was steaming right along. Right. Um, this of course led to a flooding of reinforcements into the area. And a lot of this had to do with, you know, it was a revenge mission at this point. And General Terry and Crook refused to budge without thousands of reinforcements at their disposal because they're like, they're going to come for us next. Which at this point, the, the warriors were so far fucked up. Like they they had to get the fuck out of there and they knew it. Everybody yeah. involved in that battle, like we need to make, we need to make ourselves real scarce for a while. You know, it's like at the end of a of a heist movie when they're like taking apart the gun and throwing it into three different dumpsters and mm-hmm. jumping into three different getaway cars. Now, the allied bands had won the battle, broke apart almost as soon as they had won. The people from the reservations went back to the reservations and then pretended they didn't know what the fuck anybody was talking about whenever they talked about all the white people getting killed. Like, good. I, w- I was out seeing a guy about a horse. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, you know? Yeah, let me tell you. Uh- do you hear about this? Uh, all, all these dead white people, and uh, no, you didn't. <laughs> if anybody asks, I was here the whole time, sowing this corn or whatever into the dirt. Sitting Bull and his band of people crossed into Canada and went to exile. And Crazy Horse eventually turned himself in uh, in Nebraska. Uh, there were some um, fights. They like the war went on much smaller scale for a little bit longer. America had won the last gasp of Native American warfare in the West and the genocide of the Native people of the Americas would have continued on unabetted and largely unopposed. And it still does, unarguably, until this day. Obviously, the spark of this war is multifaceted, but if you could simplify it, and I will for the sake of having an ending here, I will say is because of the over the ownership of the Black Hills. Well, this finally got figured out um, legally by the Supreme Court. You want to guess a year? Uh, I'm going to say 19, uh, 97. Okay. Not that recent. 1980. All right. 19 fucking 80 over a hundred years after the battle and after the government had stolen it. Now the Supreme court ruled in the United States versus the Sioux nation of Indians that, yep, government stole that shit. That was illegal. Um, this is, Oh, that's nice. Every once in a while, something surprising happens. 
Where's now, that there was court? there was one lone dissenter known gigantic piece of shit William Rehnquist. Um, <laughs> yeah, he was still a bastard back then too. Um, the ruling said that the government owed the full value of the land in dollars that it had seized, which they appraised to be around a hundred million dollars. Now, hmm. the Sioux was not suing for money; they were suing for their fucking land. They didn't want money. They asked yeah. for their land back and they ex- they refused to accept the money because, and I agree with them here, by accepting the money, that's accepting government control over the land, which they rightfully still reject. To this day, that money sits untouched in a Bureau of Indian Affairs account, accruing compound interests, <laughs> and as of 2021, it is worth over $1 billion. Woo! Yeah. I mean, I get it. I get, I understand, uh, you know, it's their land. It's absolutely their land. But a billion dollars is a lot. That's a lot of money, Joe. Like, I mean, if someone's offering me a billion dollars for the land that I I don't have, I'm I'm going to do in Armenia. If somebody (laughs) offered you a billion dollars for your compound, it's like, it's like, look, I keep getting people trying to buy my house for some reason. And the last thing I told him is like, I'll sell it for half a million dollars, which like you would think it's not that much money, but it's a small house in, in South city. And, uh, you know, I still maintain that. Um, if somebody wants to give me half a million dollars for this house, I would give it to them. But also this is not my ancestral lands. This is South St. Louis. If anything, I'm from Ferguson, you know? Yeah, and my my land is not a uh, um, uh, ancestral. Well, I guess it is ancestral land, but it's not a holy site. All right, <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't even. I won't even rightfully argue that the property uh, that I I live on in Armenia is ancestral because my family is not from that part of Armenia. <laughs> Um, but you're not like, even in the right ethnic area of your own Armenian people. No, but it's got a compound. It was a whole thing. I can't go back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's called Turkey now. Um, but you know, it's you know, it's religious land. It's considered very sacred to them, and they no amount of money is worth that. And I have a hard time disagreeing with them. Yeah. Nobody should. It's yeah. their fucking land. Just give it back. Um, now there was a a very weird largely unrecognized and unpopular attempt by a very strange Ron Paul esque libertarian native American named Russell means uh, to declare an independent Republic of Lakota over the land, which as all of you are aware, looking at a map right now and seeing it doesn't exist was pretty much ignored by everybody. Uh, This happened in 2008. I mean, if anybody gets, if anybody can claim sovereign citizen, it's a native American. (laughs) Uh, claiming admiralty law over the black hills of the Dakotas. Well, yeah, the only people who are just like, uh, I don't have a driver's license because I don't recognize uh, the United States government. Um, I'm part of the Lakota tribes. Like, oh, yeah, I get it. No, you're right. I wouldn't yeah. recognize this shit either. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, and Russell Means had a, had a very strange um, career in, in Native American activism ending in this Republic of Lakota thing that went ignored mostly. Um, and of course it's 2022 at the time of recording and the land has not been given back yet. As for the American survivors of the battle, historically Marcus Reno and Frederick Benteen were blamed for pretty much all of Custer's failings until quite recently. Though it's fair to say that they both fucked up pretty badly. Um, they don't deserve all of this because they wouldn't have launched that battle on their own. Um, Reno faced a courts martial in 1877, facing charges of not only incompetence, but being drunk on the day of the battle. <laughs> he was Which, found guilty. <laughs> to be fair, I probably would have been a little toasty too. Yeah, he was found guilty and dismissed from the army, but later reinstated by Ruth- President Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, in 1879, he demanded a full board of inquiry into the charges to rehabilitate his image. Uh, and it was found he acted not in cowardice, nor was he drunk. Uh, after several soldiers and officers testified on his behalf. But it still doesn't end there. Uh, Those same soldiers later said they had been threatened by uh, the other officers (laughs) to protect (laughs) Reno and Benteen. I know Benteen had not been court-martialed yet, uh, but he was testifying at the Board of Inquiry in defense of Reno, mostly because it was a circle the wagons type deal, like we have to protect ourselves um, and I will take the fall if Reno takes the fall. Therefore, I have to protect him. Then Reno 
Years later, in a conversation with an editor at a newspaper he worked at, admitted that he was, in fact, drunker than shit on the day of the Battle of Little Bighorn. <laughs> Again, I get it. Yeah. I mean, that, that was probably super common back then when, like, you know, water was just like cut whiskey or whatever. Sure. Um, it's just, it's just <laughs> water is just a uh, 3.2 Bud Light at the time. That's right. Um, now, after reinstatement, Reno got court-martialed again for getting drunk and beating up a subordinate and was again kicked out of the army, <laughs> which is impressive. Uh, how you often get, you do how that you twice. Get, right. How are you going to get kicked out of the army twice? I mean, the president had to fucking save him the first time. He just looked that gift horse right in the mouth and shot it. Um, he then spent the rest of his life attempting to restore his, re- his reputation once again before getting cancer of the mouth and dying. Um, ben Teen's <laughs> career arc followed much of the same thing, staying in the army without a court martial until he hit the rank of major. Uh, he was brevet promoted to general, got drunk, beat up a subordinate, and got thrown out of the army. Uh, now, <laughs> wait, his they pension threw people was, out for that? He again, his pension was saved by the president. This time, Grover Cleveland. So that's fun. Man, presidents love to just pardon the wrong dudes, don't they? <laughs> oh, uh, I was going to, you know, a, a long history of presidents pardoning war criminals. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they weren't charged with war crimes. They were only charged with the crimes. They did a war crime, though. Oh, they so honest. many war crimes. Well, I mean, I okay, you also can't technically consider them war crimes since those things didn't exist yet. Um, however, I don't care. Fuck them. Our modern day... Uh, you know, does it if if the, if there was a Geneva Convention in the late 1800s, there would be a Hague going. Well, actually, probably not because they are American officers, so they'd still get away with it. But look, they're assholes. Yeah. Is what I mean, we're we have to. a law on the books that if any American is charged um, at the Hague, we will invade the Hague. So <laughs> that's so fucking stupid. That, that, honestly, that sounds like a bit that we'd invent. But that's a real thing. I know. Um, but you know, in in the end. Uh, yeah, it's, it's bad news all around. Is fucking shit sucks, and it's it's uh, the the la- it's the, the 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 last and biggest victory um, that uh, a Native Americans would ever score on the U.S. military. Um, yet, anyway, I don't know. <laughs> the, the U.S. still exists. <laughs> shit could happen. I don't know. Yeah, uh, reservations and Native Americans both still exist. Uh, they could yeah. they could fucking come back. Who knows? Just, maybe they fight the government's best attempts for otherwise. Yeah, maybe maybe the natives were really hoping COVID would go uh, go go the smallpox route with the white people. Sorry, guys. Next time. Now uh, we do something on this show called questions from the legion uh we're gonna do this two hours in all right let's go yeah yeah it's not (laughs) our fault we can't shut the fuck up (laughs) i think literally it is but okay (laughs) um now this one was sent if you oh if you'd like to send us a question legion support the show uh shoot me a message on uh discord uh email or patreon patreon being the easiest um and ask us a question and we will answer it um and that's generally how Q and A's work. I don't know why I have to say that every time, uh, like I'm explaining it to myself. But uh, <laughs> look, it's because we we're both in the military for a long enough time, and you know, sometimes there's always some guy you got to explain everything step by step to. So you know, you're just and that guy is me just doing your um, due diligence. That, that is not for our listeners. That is for me. Uh, and this one is: How many clones of you would it take to uh, kill a monkey? I'm assuming they meant gorilla. It's like some monkeys are very small. Yeah, gorilla. how many Let's clones gorilla. of me? So, like, how many ver- how many of me do I need? Like, and again, there's too many questions. That, see, I don't like these hypotheticals because there's too many questions. There's like, are they? Are, do, do we get to? Am I working these clones out? Do I have these clones specifically for monkey fighting? Like, I'm assuming just, as you are right now, you just get like ten of that. Okay, I could take that. I think we could take a gorilla. I, think, I mean, it I took like, one guy to kill Harambe. I feel like I could do that now if you give me well, a, gun. a gun. Are we talking I mean, like fist fights? Like fist fighting a gorilla? I would imagine this uh, This kind of comes down to bare knuckle brawling, hand to hand kind of Ooh, uh, I don't fighting. like our odds, Francis. Look, 10 though, 10. Like, I, I'm just saying that like, I would have no problem sacrificing at least three to five of my clones. You know, just to be like, look, you guys got to be go. go <laughs> the be Luigi Cadorna of clone warfare. Okay. You gotta be you, you gotta be uh instead of bullet fighter, you gotta be banana fodder, I guess, and uh go out there and, and let the gorilla beat up on you. The the gorillas are just gonna feed you fists and tear you apart. I hear they go for balls and face first. 
but there's 10 of us. So like eventually somebody's going to get through, I think. All right, let me hit you with this. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go full Italy in this situation. I'm going to let my nine clones go in and then I'm going to set up the gorilla. <laughs> you know, there's always got to be, there's always got to be a Judas Iscariot, you know, and uh, <laughs> why not be me? <laughs> why, not, yeah. why can't it be me against my own clones? Fuck That's those right. guys. I know, I know what I've done. I don't deserve this. My, and besides, I've seen Jet Li's film, The One. I have to kill all of those clones and I become stronger. And then I'll take that grill out. <laughs> yeah. What if instead of this, there was actually a bunch of Highlanders and you all had to like kill each other and chop each other's heads off until there's the one who gets to fight the gorilla. I mean, the gorilla is watching. I'm confused as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Why are all these people in my cage? This gorilla is going to die of boredom as we try to figure out <laughs> how many fucking clones it takes to take down a monkey. I cannot think of a more boring fight than me fighting myself. I do that every fucking day of my life. So, I mean, who wants that, to watch that? That's just that? called me waking up in the morning. <laughs> yeah. uh, Francis, it has been two hours. We've <laughs> talked a lot about Custer. <laughs> Plug your show. Uh, what a hell of a way to die. Military, leftist kind of stuff. Although, mostly, Nate and I just talk about our gardens at this point because we're old. <laughs> so, if you like that, and if you like us re- making fun of the army um, without being shitty right-wing chuds, then uh, then we got that for you. The only like I've learned something important from your show, and that is I suck at gardening. I can't uh, grow shit. Look, it takes it. Gardening is not. I know a lot of people think that it's it's hard. It's not hard uh, because I ignore my garden a lot, um, and I just like check on it every three to four days. Uh, pull some weeds, tie the you know tomatoes up and stuff. I feel like a lot of people just like neglect further because they just don't give a shit, uh, which is fair. Um, not everybody wants to garden. So don't don't grow things if you're not into it. If you are into gardening, you will have a successful garden because you'll do like what you do with history. You'll obsessively read about it and figure things out and then do crop rotations and stuff. Um, See, I'm simply trying to give my plants the same love my father showed me. <laughs> you just go out and scream at them. Just get yeah, drunk I, and scream I get drunk and punch my tomato plants. <laughs> Um, everybody, thank you so much for listening to this very bloated episode. Um, mm. I, I hope you enjoyed the series. If you like our show, consider uh, throwing us a dollar. You get at Discord access, bonus episodes, early episodes. Um, you get to listen to... Uh, we have two different premium series going on on Patreon now. We're talking about HBO's Rome, two episodes at a time for uh, with uh, Francis and Shox. And then we also have History of Armenia, which is me and various people I've I've pulled into the show to talk about Armenian history, law and reparations and uh, current events as, as the world kind of goes this shit. Um, so consider donating. And if not leave us a review that helps us too. And it's free. It takes like five minutes for my understanding and everybody. Thank you again. And until next time, um, don't fuck with the look. Don't fuck with the Lakotas, man. Just leave them alone. Let them do their thing. I was going to say fist fight gorillas, but I like yours better. (laughs) So fuck.